Please take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 15. And we'll begin our reading at verse 18. John chapter 15, beginning at verse 18. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept, if they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which, are done, which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they, seen, have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. May the Lord bless in the reading of his word. You may be seated. All right, please take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 4. <clears throat> and we hope to have her sing again this evening. She, she, she didn't know that yet. <laughs> Several years ago, uh, we took a trip to Leavenworth. And one of the places we stopped was uh, Peshaston Pinnacle State Park. So you've seen that on the left-hand side as you go from, uh, from Leavenworth to Wenatchee, or if you stop at the antique shops there in, uh, in uh, was it Kashmir and so forth. Uh, and so we stopped there, and I, I decided, I'm going to climb. I'm going I'm to go on a walk. I'm going to go on a hike. And as I climbed up the, the steep hill around the first pinnacle, I was, I was enjoying the hike. I'm, I can do this. This is all right. And uh, the view was beautiful. And uh, my wife had taken a different trail. We'll, we'll, we'll meet up around the other side. And uh, as I got around the first pinnacle, I found out that the, uh, the, the, the trails did not meet. They didn't dovetail. And so I, I continued up uh, this, this trail that was getting increasingly narrow and increasingly steep. And, uh, and I came around the, uh, the third pinnacle. And uh, anticipating to hopefully meet up with my wife and uh, came to the conclusion, uh, these, these don't meet because I'm looking at her way down here. And uh, so I kept going and it was, uh, it was getting too steep to really safely turn around and come down the same way. So I figured, I'll just, there's a trail here, it's gonna go somewhere. And so I kept going. And I got up about 800 feet and I'm looking way down at the ants there in the parking lot. And, uh, and it's getting steeper and steeper, and I'm, I'm scared to death, that I, and I'm, I'm huffing and puffing, and I'm, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall over backwards, because uh, the pitch is about like this, and I'm, and I'm, I'm just going to die. Or I'm gonna, and I have my cell phone, and I said, I'm just, I just, I just going to have to call 911. They're going to have to send up a team and get me. It's going to be embarrassing, but I'll live. And uh, my wife looking up, it says, no, you can, you can do this. You can do, it's only about another, probably another 200 feet. But I'm looking down and I'm thinking, 200 feet is a lot better than, than what I've been trying to get down. And so crawling on my hands and knees, I, uh, I creep up uh, this really steep, dirty, hot, dusty, uh, working my way through the brush and everything. And then I finally come to the top. And at the top, it's flat. And I get up and I... And I just march right off because it's an easy route. There's another way down. It's very simple, and it was it was very easy. But I thought I was going to die going up. Uh, and that's about a, that's about a 1,200 foot climb. And uh, man, sometimes we 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 bite off more than we we can chew. Sometimes the the project is is much bigger than we anticipate. Uh, we we underestimate things. And, oh, I can handle this. This is no problem. Uh, sometimes it is. And uh, Nehemiah has done his homework. He knew what he needed to be done and how to do it. He, uh, he had the materials. As we saw last week, he had the manpower. 
All right, we got the material, we got the manpower, we have cleared the, the, uh, the red tape hurdles. That's all taken care of. Uh, the one thing he couldn't control was opposition. Well, I thought the king had, had given him all the, yes, yes. But the king is, uh, is four months away if you are going to go complain to him about what's going on. I've got authorization. But I've got a piece of paper. But understand, without enforcement, it doesn't matter what the law says, it's just a piece of paper. And we are dealing with that in our, our own country. Uh, anytime a believer pursues the plan of God, you can expect opposition. And uh, it isn't always where you expect it from. And sometimes you wonder, why in the world are they opposing us? I mean, this is a good thing. And, uh, and yet there's, there's opposition. There is, folks, we need to remember, there is an enemy. And he is endeavoring to, uh, to, to hinder or stop uh, any effort to, that God would have us to do. His tools are numerous. His tactics diverse. Ridicule, fear, and discouragement uh, are very often things that he will do. Sometimes it gets, uh, it gets a lot worse than that. But those are the ones that we often deal with. And in the last year and a half, we have been dealing with, with all those things in our own nation. Um, and as the folks here are building the wall there in Jerusalem, they are confronted with the same thing, that fear, the ridicule, the discouragement. Their enemies are doing everything they can within their power to put a stop to the steadily rising walls of Jerusalem, endeavoring, among other things, to convince the builders that the job just couldn't be done. It's too big. You've bitten off more than you can chew. You can't do it. So let's look at our, our text in chapter 4 and beginning in verse 1. It says, But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we built the wall, he was wroth. Now we've looked at him before. This is the fellow who is the governor of Samaria. And that word wroth means literally in the, uh, in the Hebrew language, it means he was hot. He was hot. And I don't mean, boy, it's warm in here. Uh, it was, he was enraged. He was ticked off. He, regardless of, uh, uh, of what he, uh, he may be saying, and we're going to look at some of the things there that he and his allies, uh, the enemies there of the folks there in Jerusalem, uh, what, regardless of what they were saying, they, they, they viewed this whole thing as, as a very serious threat to their, their well-being, to their prestige, and to their, uh, their pocketbook. Also, these fellows hated God. And I said, well, that doesn't say, they hated God. When you read, here's something to remember as you're reading through your Old Testament and seeing some of the, you wonder, why, how did, why did they do that? Okay, God made a promise to Abraham back in chapter 12. We talked about that on, on Tuesday. Okay, God made a promise back to Abraham in, chapter, in Genesis chapter 12. And God, when he makes a promise, Scripture says you can't lie. God must fulfill his promise. Why do you think that for 4,000 years there has been this almost nonstop parade of, of adversaries of the Jewish people. Why is it that you've got this one ethnic group that worldwide, worldwide come to about 14, 14 million people, which is not a lot of people, and yet they are always in the forefront of anything that's going on. They are hated. They are despised. There are, mil there are hundreds of millions of people in the world today that would love nothing more than the extinction of the Jewish people. Why? Because God made a promise. And if they're extinct, if they don't exist, then God can't keep his word. And so the devil does everything within his means to try to exterminate the Jew. New Testament era. God has redeemed individually different people who make up his church. And the devil hates God's children. And uh, it isn't because we are necessarily doing anything in opposition to him, although we are. It isn't that we are rubbing his fur the wrong way, although we are. It's that he hates us because of who we're related to. 
that we are God's children. God can't hurt God, or the, the devil can't hurt God. So he goes after his children. And here in, uh, in Nehemiah, Sanballat and his allies hate the Jewish people because the Jewish people are God's covenant people there on earth. In John chapter 15, verse 18, we've already read this verse, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You know, if we just said, well, I'll tell you what, this is just too rough. Uh, I'm just going to live like I did before I was saved. I'm just going to go back and, and, and try to uh, uh, be under the radar. Yes, if you do that, you will not be pleasing God. If you do that, you will be in disobedience to God. But if you do that, you will also no longer suffer persecution. Those who will live godly will suffer persecution. The scripture says so. This is the natural response, by the way, of the world. They don't realize it, but this is their nat We should not be surprised that the world hates us. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if the world is patting us on the back and saying, we really so much appreciate what you're doing, I need to really evaluate, am I doing this right? Uh, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And if the world does not oppose us, then frankly we need to maybe reevaluate. Are we, are, are we really doing what we're supposed to be doing? The world hates us because we are God's children. Now, let's make sure, by the way, that the world doesn't hate us because we're obnoxious. <laughs> let's make sure that the world does not hate us because we are doing things that are wrong, that we are being hypocritical and so on. Let's make sure the world hates us for the right reasons. All right. The message of the gospel is offensive to the lost. It's what they need, but it's offensive to the lost. Let's make sure that it is the message and not the messenger. Amen. We need to strive to make sure that we, as much as possible, as much as lieth in you, the scripture says, and I love that, as much as lieth in you, because that lets you know that sometimes it's just not possible. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. <laughs> and some people just refuse to be lived peaceably with. But we need to make sure that it's not us, it's them. Amen. He's hot. He's angry. And uh, he took great indignation. And what's his first response? He is going to mock the Jews. I'm going to say disparaging things. I'm going to make fun of them. Now, I'm angry. That's why I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm livid with what's going on. I view it as a genuine threat. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to back down and just ridicule. Pretend it's, it's, it's something beneath me. And I'm just going to, to ridicule and mock them. I'm going to demean them. I'm actually going to do all I can with words. And seeking to make the, the Jews who are working this think little of themselves. You know, it's interesting... Uh, Words can, even if there's no truth in them, can have a, have a great impact. Look at verse 2. And he spake before his brethren uh, and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish that are burned? It's not possible. The job's too big. There's not enough workers. They're just not skilled enough. It will take too long. It's just beyond them. It can't be done. Now, understand, he does see this as a real threat. But he's trying to convince the people who are hearing him that it's not really a threat. It's a, it's a pathetic effort. And the reality is that uh, it was a true effort. And a, but if you hear the negative, I don't know, maybe he's right. Man, this is, this is an awful mess. I, I mean, and we've been working hard for, 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 for quite a while. I don't know if we've really, man, I don't know. And if we're hearing the negative all the time, then we're going to want, well, can, can it be done? Because these guys over here, I mean, they may know. Well, they're lying. They're lying. Understand that the devil's minions lie. It's what they do. It's what they do. And uh, look at verse 3. Now, Tobiah, the Ammonite, now he is probably the governor of Ammon, that would be east of Jordan, was with him, and he said, now, it's kind of interesting, the devil's minions are all allied with each other in this particular case. 
Now, very often they're busy fighting each other because they all hate each other. Because they hate everybody. But if the devil has a purpose and a plan, he's more than happy to, to have his, his uh, people all get together to fight against a common enemy. It's, a, it's an interesting thing that uh, when Israel, before Israel came into existence, all right, the modern state of Israel, before that became in, came into existence, all these Arab tribes and all these different people, they were constantly fighting each other. And they still are. When did they get together? When they want to fight Israel. We're going to set aside all of our differences because we all hate these guys more than we hate each other. And that's what's going on here. The Ammonites, who are east of Jordan, are allied with the Samaritans, who are north of, of, uh, of Jerusalem. And uh, he says that even, if, even that which they build, if a fox go up, it shall break down their stone wall. It's, it's, it's such sloppy, fragile work that if a fox, an animal the size of a house cat, were to jump up there, it would crumble under this, this animal that weighs, uh, weighs six or seven pounds. It's all wasted effort, wasted time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning verse 27, and by the way, this is, tr this is, this is the church that he's describing. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Have you ever noticed and by the way, you can read church history, and you can, this, is, this, is, this is standard operating procedure, that God uses very ordinary things. God uses very ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. Uh, I'm reading a history of missions right now, and uh, virtually every missionary that uh, I'm reading about, and, and there's score, dozens and dozens of them, were very ordinary people. They were tradesmen. They were they were uh, got blacksmiths and shoemakers and 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 uh, and farmers and so on that that committed their lives to God. Went to some place. This is back before you had, uh, you know, where malaria and headhunters and all this was all real heavy, you know, serious business. You show up and you may not survive more than a day after you arrive on the on the field. Don't want to scare you folks over here, and. Uh, and yet they went, and they went by the drove. And God did extraordinary things with very, very ordinary means. And God, that's what God does. If you look in your Old Testament, who was the greatest king that is listed there? David. What was David before he became king? He's a shepherd. He's a guy chasing sheep. He's a kid chasing sheep, and yet God took this fellow who had a heart for the things of God and through a series of experiences that were a lot of hardship. I tell you what, if you, look, if you look at the life of David, you're looking at a life of great hardship. But the hardship was training for the posts that God would give him. God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. What does God want? He wants your will. He wants your will. He'll provide the power. He'll provide the ability. What he wants is your will. Amen. And so the Christians were, were, were or the, the, the folks who were attacked and lied about. You know, that happens to us all the time. How many times have you been told, oh, you're narrow-minded? And I will say, yes, yes I am. Thank you very much. I, I hold to absolutes, which is a big no-no in today's society, in today's culture. But I hold to absolutes. The Bible is my sole rule of faith and practice. Do's and don'ts are decreed by God. Amen. Well, you're intolerant. Yes, I am. If God calls it wicked, then it's wicked. Pop, I want you to understand, popular culture does not dictate right and wrong. Amen. And that's very important. Your average Joe out there doesn't see it. But popular culture 
does not dictate right and wrong. Government does not dictate right and wrong. If that was the case, then we can, we can justify the Holocaust. All right? Government does not dictate right and wrong. Well, we're not, we're not Nazi Germany. We're not so far removed. It didn't take them very long from being the most advanced country in Western Europe to becoming Nazi Germany. And as a matter of fact, they almost pulled off the war because they were the most advanced country in Western Europe. But they set aside biblical absolutes, and right and wrong became the position of the government. And there are countries all around the, the world, including our own, that, that are demanding that, that they, they set the standard. That government and culture determines right and wrong. God's word is right, and everything that disagrees with it is wrong. Well, you guys are always trying to force your view on others. We are not trying to force our view on others. By the way, people who accuse you of a wrong are very often wrestling with the same thing themselves. All right? The, the tolerance of those who oppose Christianity isn't. It doesn't exist. It's a, it's a sham. They are intolerant. A reaction to biblical standards of right and wrong is seen constantly in the world. Okay, we have abortion in our country. We have, we're starting this, we see this a little bit here and there, euthanasia in the United States. It's prominent in some other places, especially in Western Europe, Netherlands, Belgium. P Senior citizens are scared to death to check into hospitals in Belgium because they have no guarantee that they'll actually be treated and let go. For all they know, they're going to get a shot, and that's the end of it. If they've determined that, you, that you're done, they may make an end of you, and you have no choice in the matter. This is uh, murder by any other name. History is filled with with examples of this, where the government authorizes things, the government determines right and wrong, the government determines ethics. The Holocaust, the forced abortions in China, the Armenian genocide, all these things for the good of, of country and society. <laughs> and, and these people think that we're dangerous. The world knows, frankly, very little of Christian doctrine. Your average person on the street, especially here in the Northwest, know, know precious little of Christian doctrine. They don't know what we believe or why. Why is that? It used to be when you were, when everybody had at least a little bit of background. We have seen a decline in our quote unquote Christian culture. Part of it, we still don't have. A huge decline. There's been some, but we don't have a huge decline in the percentage of people who go to church. Then how come they don't know? Because the churches don't teach them anything. People go to church all their lives, and they hear all kinds of things, but they don't understand what Christians believe. They don't understand uh, basic Christian doctrine. Even those who claim to be evangelical are, are very shallow in their presentation of truth. A great deal of what goes for evangelical today isn't. All right? They, they talk the talk. They talk about Jesus. Everybody gets all happy and excited about Jesus. Yes, but when we deal with the gospel, I am a sinner, a lost, damned, doomed, helpless sinner. And I am in need of a Savior. Amen. People don't like that. That's negative. Don't tell me with all this negative stuff. I don't like this negative stuff. Well, then we'll just tell you about all the good stuff about what Jesus is and what he's done for you and, and all these things that he wants you to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And if, you, if that's all you're preaching, number one, that's not true. But we have bypassed the whole need of the idea of him being the Savior and what we need to be saved from. There is no gospel there. There is no good news there. It's telling people a lie to make them feel good, but it's a lie. Mm -hmm. And one of these days they'll stand before the judge who, who offered them salvation. But they weren't told. 
They weren't told that they were sinners in need of a Savior. But I went to church, and I got baptized, and, 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 and the guy had the Bible, and I went to church every week. Yes, but did you ever hear the gospel? Did you ever hear the gospel? And I dare say that probably 9 out of 10 churches in the United States today are not preaching a straight gospel this morning. And I'm not even preaching on the gospel this morning. I'm preaching on Nehemiah rebuilding a wall. We cannot spend all of our time correcting the lies that are told about us. Number one, we're outnumbered. The general reality is that whoever shouts the, the loudest and the longest gets the hearing and gets the, uh, gets the acceptance of what's true. It's called propaganda. And until the Lord's return, this is, there, there will always be more of them than there are of us. So how do you fix the problem? The best thing we can do is not the ballot box. I encourage you to vote. The best solution is evangelism. Amen. If you want to see people's lives changed, if you want to see their outlook changed, see somebody born again. And we need to make sure that that is our focus. Evangelism is, evangelism is the, frankly, the only cure for society. William Quayle wrote this in 1910. He said, the sole way to make a good state is to have regenerated citizens. That's 111 years ago he said that. We forget things. But it's true. The job of the church is not to force the conformity of society to some standard, but rather to evangelize and let God do works of transformation in the, in the individual. Let's make sure we don't get distracted and, and, and put our focus into social justice and, and social programs and, and fixing society, even from a Christian perspective. Our job as believers is to make and disciple people. Make, make, make disciples and, and, and teach them. That's our job. Let's not get distracted. Let's focus on the task that God has given us. Verse 6. Nehemiah is praying. We'll start in verse 4. He's getting this ridicule. The enemies are saying these various things. And he says in verse 4, Hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head. Give them for a prey in the hand of, of, of captivity. Cover not their iniquity. They're, in, they're unrepentant. Let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. They are enemies of God's people and they are unrepentant. Let them suffer the consequences of their sin. Verse 6. Does, by the way, does Nehemiah stop? Do the people stop? No. Amazingly. So built we the wall, and all the wall, now remember, we looked at this last week, it's a, between a mile and a half and two and a half miles long in circumference. It's a lot of wall. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together under the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. All right? The whole thing, there are no gaps. All the wall is hooked together. So we've got a continuous wall at this point in time, and it's half high. So probably between, between four and six feet high. All the way around. They didn't quit. There's no gaps. It's continuous. Half its height is completed. Probably uneven. I mean, we're dealing with, a, with an approximation here. But we're halfway there. In spite of the ridicule, in spite of all the trouble that we're going to be seeing and will be seeing in the next week or two, we're halfway there. Oh, I think I'm going to die. I've got to climb up this hill. Yes, we only have 200 feet more to go. I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can make it. But it says the people had a mind to work. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, that's not entirely true. But I'd rather have the words than the sticks and the stones. 
great progress was being made in spite of the, the opposition. Thus far, it's only words. Verse 8, or verse 7, rather. Now, they have tried the propaganda machine. They have thrown out a lot of words there. They're trying to discourage the workers. They're trying to build themselves up in doing that. And it came to pass when Sanballat, okay, remember he's the, uh, the governor of Samaria, to the north, and Tobiah, okay, he's the, the governor of, of Ammon to the east, and the Arabians, that's probably with Geshem who was mentioned earlier, and they are to the south. And then it mentions uh, another group here. It says the Ashdodites. Who are the Ashdodites? Okay. The Philistines to the west, the Philistines had, was, a, was a, a pentopolis. What's a pentopolis? It was a group of five cities. You know, we have the tri-cities over there east of the mountains. Okay. This is a group of five cities. It was a confederacy. And at this point in time, the lead city was the city of Ashdod. Gaza, by the way, is one of those. Still in existence today. Gath, where Goliath was from, was one of those cities. All right. So Ashdod. So we had the Philistines to the west. So we have got people to the north and the east and the south and the west. People who in the past have not always gotten, gotten, out, gotten along with each other, but here they are allied together in opposition to what's happening in between all of them, in the midst of all of them. It says it came to pass when Salem, Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and the breaches began to be stopped. It says they were very, oh, they're hot again. Oh, they're ticked off. They are enraged. And words have not worked. So we're going to try something else. Verse 8, they conspired, all of them, to come together and fight against Jerusalem to hinder it. Now understand that none of these are independent countries. They are all part of the Persian Empire. They all are supposed to be paying homage to the, to the king of Persia. They all send tax revenue to the king of Persia. They are all governors. This would be like, you know, let's say you're, the, you're, uh, you're doing something in Colorado, and the governor of Kansas, and the governor of Wyoming, and the governor of New Mexico, and the governor of Utah are going to attack Colorado. Yeah, but you're all part of the United States. Yes, same thing here. But, but Colorado's a threat to our economy there in New Mexico. They're hurting our economy because they're prosperous. So we need to, to do something. Yeah, but, but you guys are all answering. You're not... Yes, but it, in this time, day and time, again, it's months to have to report back to the king. So they're scrambling to deal with things locally and put an end to it before any word can get back to Persia. They are dealing with a very strong passion in their hatred, deep-seated hatred, and mounting anger. The rebuilding is actually happening, and we have thus far been unable to stop it. It's happening. The work of God is happening, and we don't like this, and we need to put a stop to it. And so we're actually going to take up arms. We have tried... We have tried uh, uh, words and so on. We have tried to undermine these folks. We have tried the, the, uh, the whole uh, uh, idea of demeaning these folks. And that has not worked. So now we're going to take up arms and go against them. Whew. Verse 9. Nevertheless, we, this is Nehemiah speaking, made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Now, the conspiracy. There's united opposition. They are historic rivals as well as temporal rivals. They are coordinated by the devil. By the way, the bad guys, the guys who are opposing the work of God, then and now, would probably, not knowingly, willingly, work for the devil. But that's what they're doing. In our nation today, those who are the most hostile don't even believe there's a devil. And yet they are stooges of Satan and oblivious minions. They are slaves to the devil and don't even know it.
But they know that they are opposing God's people. They are, know that they are undermining the work of God. That's their goal. But they don't recognize the fact that the devil is their master. They share his goals. They share their root purpose and motivation. And so they're going to actually fight. They're going to put together some soldiers, put together some, uh, some troops, and attack Jerusalem. You know, a lot of believers in the world today face this now. Uh, there are nations in Africa. There are a great many nations in the Middle East. There are a few places in Southeast Asia where they face serious governmental opposition. In China. It's interesting that... Uh, the, the opposition, the, the persecution that we read about in Fox's Book of Martyrs and other books of that nature, we think, well, that's all ancient history. There is more persecution today than there has ever been historically. More Christians are slaughtered in these, these, these current years than were, than were killed uh, 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 300 years ago or 1,000 years ago. What is the believer's response Nehemiah sets up a defense. He does not go on the offense. There is no place in the New Testament where a believer is to go on the offense when it comes to violence. We are authorized to defend ourselves, and even then we have to be careful. What does he do? He prays. Understand the real battle that is going on is unseen. We are dealing with a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And yet if you were to pit the devil in all of his power and all of those who were with him, all of his demons and so on, against God, 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I have God living within me. Now, this doesn't mean I can tell the devil to take a height. Resist the devil, therefore, and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This doesn't mean, by the way, that the, the devil's minions will leave us alone either. History and, and the news today tells us otherwise. But the response was to pray. We said a prayer. We, said, we, we, we prayed. We made our prayer unto our God for protection that God would thwart the enemy plans. I pray for that every Saturday night. I pray that God would thwart the work of evildoers in our country. And they set a guard. I can ask God to protect me. Does that mean I leave my door unlocked? No. God, I'm, I'm, I, I got to go into this dark, this, this, this tough neighborhood. I've got, I've got to go uh, to this place where there's, there's a high crime rate. And Lord, I'm going to ask you to protect me, so I'm going to leave my car unlocked. I'm going to walk down the street with money hanging out of my pockets. Um, God, most of the time, now sometimes God is gracious even under these circumstances, most of the time God will not do for us what we are fully capable of doing on our own. If God has told us to do certain things, you know, a little common sense, a little, a little, a little planning and so on, that, that's something we ought to be doing. And so he sets a guard. He sets a guard. He's asked for protection. He's asked the Lord for protection, but he sets a guard. I'm asking God to do something, but I'm going to do everything I can as I'm asking God to protect us. And Judah said, this would be the, uh, the, all the workers, verse 10. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. The people are discouraged. Now part of it is the propaganda that they have been getting. Part of it is the reality of their circumstances. It is a big job. It is that overwhelming job. Maybe we have bitten off more than we can chew. Yes, it's something that needs to be done. Yes, it's something we ought to do. But, oh my word, can we do it? Can we do it? There's just too much to do. It's too hard. It, 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 it can't be done. Exhaustion. It is, it is very much easier to start something than it is to finish it. 
Uh, I can think of all sorts of jobs that, I can, uh, that have been done that, that you, you get it started, you think, oh, I can't. You're, there's the, the initial enthusiasm, and then you get into it. <sighs> can I finish it? Will I have the steam to finish it? Will I have the energy to finish it? Will I have the resources to finish it? Will I have enough time to finish it? I'm overwhelmed by the magnitude of the job. We're not able, it says their conclusion, we are not able to build the wall. In verse 11, and our adversaries said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. The work will be stopped because, because the enemy is going to kill us. There's the never-ending potential for attack, especially at night. Remember, there's no street lights or anything. It's, when it's dark, it's dark. And so they're surrounded by, by worry, by anxiety, overwhelmed by the circumstances. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For God, our God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And then it says uh, in 1 John 4, 18, but perfect love casteth out fear. And I've shared this before. Uh, a year and a half ago, I had my, my bypass surgery, which was a, 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 an, a really weird experience for me because I'm never, I was in the hospital bed instead of standing next to it. I was the patient and people were coming to see me. That was weird. My wife and my kids were scared to death. I was just along for the ride. I was having a great time. I won't say I was having a great time, but I had, I had perfect peace of mind in the whole thing. It was, it, was, it was the weirdest, it was a blessed experience. But it was, it was, a, it was an odd thing. Yeah, you, do you know that you may not survive this? That I had a guy in my room the night before the surgery, I was, I, I, evidently I was on the verge of a major heart attack. And a guy was in my room the whole night before the surgery watching the monitors. It wasn't just on, on some, of alar some alarm stuff. There was a guy, I, really was, I was close enough to something serious that I had a guy in my room watching all the monitors all night long. I felt fine. I was ready to go home. I had peace of mind. I was not afraid. What's the worst thing that can happen to me? I get to go to bed. I get to go to heaven. I get to be, now my, my family is all upset, you know, but I had, I had peace of mind. It was, it, it was, a, it was an odd experience. I'd never been there before. And this, the most dangerous thing I had been in that I was aware of, and I had peace of mind. I have been in greater panic for things that are of no consequence, and here I am in the most serious thing in my life, Perfect peace of mind. That is something that God gives because it wasn't in here to begin with. Because I've gotten all bent out of shape and upset and scared about things that were of no consequence. And you have too. God hath not given us the spirit of fear but a power and of love in a sound mind. If I am, there is no better place to be, there is no greater peace of mind, regardless of where it may be, than to be in the place that God has for you. Amen. Doing what God would have you to do. You are better off there than any place else. And it doesn't matter how hard or how difficult. Because you're never alone because God's with you. Amen. And the best place for you to be, the greatest peace of mind you will ever have, is being exactly where God would have you be, doing what God would have you do. With these folks here building the wall, again, they're hearing it. The propaganda's working. The warnings of the enemies around them. Look at verse 12, and it came to pass when the Jews which dwelt by them, the, the, the Jewish folks that were living near all these people, or even in their midst, they're here in the news, and so they bring it down to Jerusalem. And they said unto us ten times, from all places whence ye return unto us, they will be upon you. 
Now, perhaps this was well-intentioned, but it's undermining morale. And so if we leave it at this, now we're going to see how this goes uh, in the next, uh, next few weeks. But if you leave it at this, it's like, man, this is just, yeah, we started out with so much excitement, so much enthusiasm, and, uh, and, and it looked like everything was coming together and everything was going our way, and now we're, now we're scared, now we're tired, now we're overwhelmed, and now our lives are in danger and we're scared to death. God is no longer in their focus. God is too small in their eyes. Recognize the fact that if God wants, we deal with an omnipotent God. And if God wants it to happen, nothing can stop it from happening. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 25 through 31, go ahead, it's familiar stuff, but go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter, 20, or chapter 14. Starting in verse 22, it says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. When we talk about ship, we don't think about a big ship. Think about a, uh, a really big rowboat. And to go before him unto the other side. So they're going to be rowing across the Sea of Galilee about six to eight miles while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come... He was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. It's, it's very choppy. And in the fourth watch of the night, it's about three in the morning, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now again, remember, it's, it's, it's fairly dark, quite dark. They're out in the middle of the lake. At night. Now, generally speaking, they, they did do some fishing at night there, but it's choppy. They wouldn't normally be fishing. They're going to wait for calmer, calmer water. So these guys are out there by themselves, probably uh, a mile or more from shore. And they see Jesus walking on the water. And it says in verse 26, when they saw him walking on the sea, they were, I love this, they were troubled. Um, it means that they were scared out of their minds. Uh, and the, uh, the parallel passages, it says, they said it is a spirit. That word spirit there is not the same word that we use for Holy Spirit. It's the word we get our, our word phantom or fan, or, uh, our word phantom from. They thought it was a ghost. They're scared out of their minds. They see this, this spirit walking on the water, and they're out there in the middle of the lake. There's no place to go. They can't escape. They're in a boat, and there's a mile of water all the way around them. There's no place to go. And they cried out in fear. Ah! And straightway, immediately, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And so they calmed down. And Peter answered and, answered and said, Lord, if it, be, if it be thou, bid me come out onto the water. Now, we... Already they've calmed down, but Peter, outrageous, impulsive Peter says, can I come out there too? Now, it's choppy. The waves are going up and down. And he said, come. And Peter came down out of the boat and walked on the water. He just, he stepped right over the gunwale and off he went. And he's looking at Jesus. It says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, just a few moments before, he's all enthusiastic. This is exciting. This is thrill. I've never done this before, and you never will again either. I'm walking on water. I'm walking to Jesus. He told me to come, and I can do it. I can do it because Jesus said I could. And then I start looking around, and I think, what am I doing? People can't walk on water. And then he begins to sink. You can because the Lord said you could. 
It's when we get our, our focus on the problem around us instead of focusing on the God who can empower us and does empower us to do what we're supposed to be doing that we begin to have trouble. Fear is a problem when we get our eyes off of God. So remember this, you can do anything God has commanded you to do. And by that I mean in the book. Don't we say, well, yeah, well, I had a dream or I had, no, no. God, God will enable you to do anything he tells you to do. And he never asked the impossible of his children. If, if we don't do what God has told us to do, that's sin. As a child of God, as a forgiven, blood-bought saint, God never commands me to do something he does not equip me to do. I can do anything I'm supposed to do. I can do anything God has commanded me to do. And it doesn't matter how, the magnitude of the thing, I can do it. Amen. Not in my own strength, not in my own ability, not in my own determination. I can do it because I'm empowered by God. Amen. I need to submit myself to him. And in resisting the opposition, 1 Peter 5, 7, or, or, or uh, 1 Peter 5, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. What's, what's the first thing that has to be done? I submit myself to God. So, as we look at the, the dilemma that we face in our world today, which is a slightly different version of the dilemma that we faced in the world last year and the year before and the year before and the year before, Recognize the fact that we, need, we have a job to do, and God has equipped us to do it. God enables us to do it. We are bombarded by the propaganda of the enemy. We are bombarded by the actual, sometimes physical, activity of the enemy to oppose us. What are we to do? We are to pray, we are to watch, and we are to work. We don't quit. Don't allow fear and discouragement to keep you from doing and being what you're supposed to do and be. God is greater than the problems you face. Heavenly Father, thank you. We have much to do. Every person in this room has a job to do for you. And yet, we are sometimes overwhelmed by the circumstances that we face. We are overwhelmed by the, the, the size of the job. We are overwhelmed sometimes by, by opposition. And yet none of these things really should overwhelm us. You are greater than any of the things that we face. It's been said that you and God always make a majority. And so, Father, may we recognize that. You empower us to do and be what, we're, what we are supposed to do and be. May we never quit. May we never be overwhelmed. And, Father, keep us from discouragement. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's stand, please.